Okay, uh, this is where we ended up, and hopefully uh, I have repeated myself enough times that you are by now tired of uh, this uh, picture, and that uh, that's good, because I mean, that should mean that uh, you now know all its different uh, aspects of this. So, uh, let's uh, examine the next topic, which is the scale dependence of the various quantities uh, that uh, <coughs> are Actually, before that, I should uh, say one thing which I didn't uh, say that explicitly. Uh, well, I can just say it here, I guess. Uh, remember I said that uh, the calculation of the uh, short distance part, the part cross-section, is obtained by calculating a partonic cross-section using this as a parton, and also then calculating the partonic uh, parton distributions, finding this parton inside that parton, and divide one by the other, or subtract one from the other, then you get this one. Now, as far as the dependent, scale dependence and the uh, scheme dependence that you often hear about, uh, where does that come in? It should be, uh, you should be clear uh, on the following uh, uh, consideration. When you calculate either a physical cross-section or even for a platonic uh, cross-section here, it, uh, it certainly should not depend on what scheme or what scale you choose. For instance, imagine the example we did for the gluon fusion diagram. When you calculate, it comes out to be a function, whatever it is. Uh, if it's finite in particular, then it doesn't depend on any, any <coughs> artificial uh, scheme or, or, or scale or anything. But when you try to calculate this object next, this has a, uh, a matrix element by local operator definition, and which usually is infinite. And in order to make sense of this, as I said, you have to do a subtraction. At that point, this becomes scale scheme dependent and scale dependent. And if this is not scheme and scale dependent, and this is scheme and scale dependent, then when you set this to be equal to this divided by that or, sub or, or minus that, then this inherits a scheme dependence and a scale dependence depend on what scheme and what scale you choose here. And that's very important to keep in mind, all right? Because this question about scale dependence, scheme dependence occurs over and over again when you participate in seminars and uh, discussions and so on. A lot of people have confusions because they didn't know where these dependencies come in. And that is the reason why I go into such length in go over uh, these with you. Even if we don't do a lot of these hard calculations, we have to know what those calculations uh, actually, uh, what kind of complication they get into. Anyway, so uh, it's because of that, uh, uh, that consideration, the pattern distribution functions will have, in particular, uh, a scale dependence. But because pattern distribution functions are the analogs of uh, a renormalization constants, uh, you know that its mu dependence is given by a function like this, uh, an equation like this, which is technically a renormalization group equation. And that is why the coefficients here is called, sometimes also called, the anomalous dimension. It's called a splitting function. It's called a DGLAP evolu uh, evolution kernel. And it is called anomalous dimensions. So these are all the same names for the same, uh, for the same function. Uh, if uh, being renormalization, the equivalent of renormalization constants, uh, uh, coefficients, or anomalous dimension coefficients, this, this function, splitting function itself is calculable in 
order by order in perturbation theory. And uh, it starts out with order alpha. And the, this is the leading order is of order alpha. The leading order splitting function is well known. It's written down in all the textbooks. Uh, and the next, the, the, uh, this, the so-called two-loop evolution kernel, uh, no, sorry, this is the, uh, that's right. This has been known also for quite a long time. Uh, a recent uh, advance, which uh, took 20 years to complete, is uh, uh, the, two, the, the three loop evolution kernel, which had just become available uh, last year. Now, the splitting kernels are, uh, again, you see by nature of this equation, it's independent of the parent uh, particle. That is why you can calculate this using partonic uh, parton distribution functions. Once you've calculated this, it is also applicable to the hadronic ones. You simply replace the partonic label by a hadron label that's called a capital A, and then it's the same kernel which applies. So you, you see again the magic of factorization. Okay, once you have a factorized structure, you can do it in one context and use it in a different context. The partonic world <coughs> is where you know how to do the calculation. The hadronic world is where you'd like to actually use this equation. And uh, um, so this is nothing short of uh, magical. Uh, so this is the equivalent of that equation. And I've already said that. So, <coughs> That's next, so suppose since those kernels are known, we can solve those evolution equations. We can predict the, uh, how the pattern distributions evolve. The question then is, now if we look at the third phase of that uh, uh, factorization formula, where we want to make predictions of a physical cross-section by using the pattern distribution functions which is already determined from global analysis and from your theory friends uh, calculation of the calculation of uh, uh, production of your favorite particle Susie or whatever uh, out of uh, proton uh, out of uh, uh, quarks and gluons so they give you this calculation and you use that uh, the existing pattern distributions you make a prediction, and you want to know, uh, since there seems to be re uh, renormalization, scale dependence here, and the factorization scale dependence over here, then shouldn't this prediction here also depend on the scale? But in principle, a physical cross-section shouldn't depend on any scale, okay? So how, how, uh, where is this dilemma? come from and how do you uh, in practice uh, handle this problem as I said I'm sure when you participate in seminars or in your group meetings uh, you know these questions arise all the times all kind of people offer their opinions about uh, uh, such scale dependence and if you have such experience you will also know uh, most people who speak strongly about these well, at least a good fraction of those who have very strong opinions about this actually <coughs> don't really know what they're talking about. Uh, <coughs> so hopefully, you know, after coming out of this summer school, you will be uh, uh, not one of those. So let's, let's get the discussion started. Uh, here we are. There are these explicit uh, mu dependencies. So how do they go when you actually start to make a prediction? Uh, in principle, the choice of these, uh, as I said, are arbitrary, and I have already shown you graphically how the how does the <laughs> factorization scale come in. Uh, in that simple example I gave you, you know, remember I had a graph which uh, with the integrand like this. I say you divide the long distance and short distance part by just drawing a boundary, which is the scale. 
you, when you slide that scale over uh, back and forth, the overall answer, of course, shouldn't change. Actually, I think the next slide shows exactly that. So when you move this boundary back and forth, you make this part scale dependent. This boundary is called mu. So when you shift this boundary, this becomes mu dependent. This also becomes mu dependent. But the total integral, of course, is independent of mu. So in other words, the mu dependence here and the mu dependence here cancel each other by definition. That's why this quantity, in principle, doesn't depend on mu. However, if you carry this through to all, this is just one example calculated at one particular order. When you try to do this in general, you try to calculate this quantity, for instance, using the precise definition that I mentioned, then you do need to regularize this quantity. It introduces this dependence here. And in principle, that dependence, again, is reflected in here. They should compensate each other. But since we are using the perturbative approach, we only calculate this to the accuracy of a given order, let's say order n. The cancellation between the two are guaranteed only up to that order. So here we go. If we want to, if we truncate the perturbation series, instead of summing the perturbation from order 1 to infinity, you only sum it from 1 to 1, or 1 to 2 at the moment, then if you look, then there is uh, some mu dependence. And the mu dependence of the left-hand side, <coughs> of course, using the chain rule of differentiation, is just these two. And the cancellation that I talked about here is guaranteed to occur at the order in which you do your calculation. It's not guaranteed beyond that because you only, you know, you only know it to order n. So this derivative here is going to be of one order higher than the order to which you have calculated this. And that is why there's some, always some residual uh, dependence. All right? And you have to need to know how to control it. So in practice, how do you choose the, the scale? So far, uh, we finally stated this in principle. So let me discuss again, for the purpose of this introductory course, only the simplest possible example which should illustrate the point. Uh, in order to simplify the discussion, in fact, I'm going to set the renormalization scale and the factorization scale the same, because the guideline for choosing these scales, even if they are independent, the guideline for choosing them are similar. So let's just make our life easier for ourselves. First of all, you want to use a perturbative approach, and the perturb perturbation series is usually expanded in powers of alpha, and in practice, it's actually alpha divided by pi. In order for the perturbative approach to, to uh, make sense, you obviously want this quantity to be much less than one. Luckily, we have asymptotic freedom, but asymptotic freedom says this quantity is much, much less than one, provided the scale you choose is much, much larger than lambda QCD. Otherwise, it doesn't hold, all right? So the first criteria is that this has to be big. It has to be certainly uh, uh, a few GeV uh, uh, or, 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 or more. Second is now when you go to, uh, when, when you look up the expressions for the hard scattering uh, <coughs> matrix element, to each order in perturbation series, in addition to the power of alpha, I've already pointed to you, uh, to the fact that for each loop of the uh, Feynman integration, there is at least one power of logarithm of the large scale which appears in the calculation. So the expansion is usually this combination. In some particular examples, actually you have two logarithms uh, uh, for any, uh, for given alpha. So, clearly, uh, e this is not sufficient. This is necessary, but suffi not sufficient. And you need this quantity not to become very large. Otherwise, you are, not in, uh, you are in trouble again. 
And that is the reason we need to do factorization. Remember, we had Q over M before. When you have Q over M, it is guaranteed to be big. And, then it, and that's the reason we do the factorization. Now, when you have Q over mu, and you don't want this to be big, then you have to choose. So you can't choose these to be two very different. These, the ratio here has to be of order one in order for the expansion to be, to be uh, uh, valid. That tells you that you have to choose mu to be uh, not only much larger than lambda QCD, but off order Q. And therefore, in most of the formulas you saw, or the factorization formula, the, the letter mu actually usually don't occur. It is because the natural choice is Q, people just write Q in the place of mu. That, of course, is pr in practice what we do, but that sometimes is misleading. Again, it's misleading because people then forgot where it comes from. They say, this is the Q dependence of the thing. But it's not the Q dependence, it's the mu dependence. All right? And for those who understand the underlying physics, you know the distinction. Again, for those who don't understand this, that creates all kinds of confusion. All right, so mu must be chosen to be the same order as Q. So we say mu is of the order of C times Q, and C is of order 1, and that's it. Nobody says C has to be equal to 1. As long as the logarithm is not large, it can be logarithm of 2 or logarithm of 3, that's still okay, as long as it's not logarithm of 100 or 10 or whatever, right? So that creates an ambiguity. And that was the discussion during the recitation. When someone asked a question, when uh, Max Klein was complaining that uh, you know, we normally choose Q, and then we say, oh, let C vary from a half to two, and you get some range of predictions. And those are really arbitrary. So uh, and what is the uncertainty? when you choose different C. As I already said, the mu dependence is, you know, D mu, D, D mu of this quantity is of one order higher. Therefore, choosing different C give you differences which are of one order higher, which is okay, in a sense, because you haven't calculated the next order, so, so you can tolerate a difference of that kind. So, in practice, we estimate the uncertainty by letting the C vary over a certain range. <laughs> I actually had it originally here, one half to two, because Max Klein had complained it so much. I went back last night and changed it to A to B. You choose whatever you like, A to B, you know. <laughs> Unfortunately, Max is not here. I mean, it's, it's, uh, so my effort was wasted. <laughs> All right. So let's let I give you an example, and this is uh, the mu dependence of the renormalization scale rather than the factorization scale, but it works the same way. Let's go back to the total cross action for uh, uh, the e plus e minus annihilation in the hadrons. This is an infrared safe quantity. All right, so we don't invoke factorization, and you just. Uh, use uh, this infrared safe to calculate to uh, this leading order, uh, leading order here, next leading order, this is next next leading order, this is a quantity which has been calculated into uh, three loops. It's a very high order expansion. So the coefficients are like this. And as you can see, you have mu dependence in alpha, you have mu dependence in the coefficient functions, just as we mentioned uh, that it would not usually happen. So you can now uh, plot your prediction as a function of mu. Uh, did I write down? This is written as p because we parameterized, uh, oh, I didn't specify. Huh. So uh, P is defined to be 
mu is defined to be uh, q times e to the power p. So p from minus e to the minus 3 to plus 2. So this is a very wide range. Okay? And here's what happens. At leading order, the, as a function of choice of mu, not only you have a very steep dependence, but it's monotonic. And that's not surprising, <laughs> because at leading order, this, the mu, only mu dependence is here. And alpha, as you know, is a monotonically decreasing function of mu. And if that's all what you have, then you see the prediction is very uncertain over a relatively large range over this uh, But when you do the next leading order cancellation, uh, calculation, the two terms, there are compensation now between the two terms. The difference when you vary is of one higher order. And you see the, the, that this monotonic behavior actually uh, becomes much more moderate. In addition, there is one region in which there is, uh, this is actually flat. Flat, of course, means there's very little mu dependence. So many people would then argue this is the best choice of mu, which gives the, you the most stable answer. But it is, it is a reasonable uh, uh, statement, but there's no absolute proof of it. These two lines indicate a, uh, so suppose you choose this stable point as mu hat, where this is equal to zero, then you can estimate the uncertainty, for instance, by varying mu from uh, this range. And in that case, you get this prediction here. You say uh, a reasonable guess of the uncertainty is this much. Now, uh, what happens if you now do a next, next leading order? So now I've expanded the scale somewhat, just concentrate on the middle part. The next, next leading order calculation, the highest order calculation you've done, which has been done so far, is given here. You see, this, this steep dependence of the next leading order is, goes away. It's even uh, more stable. Than this one, but on the other hand, uh, this actually lies uh, outside that band that you predicted based on this alone. But of course, there is no reason the band should be centered here. The band, which gives you a estimate of the order of magnitude of uncertainty, can be shifted up and down. In that case, I mean, you can see. The difference between the next leading order and the next leading order indeed is of the same order of magnitude as this one, although the central value is shifted. So this is really uh, what happens in general. But as I said during the recitation last, last night, the situation is not identical for every process. It's, it's a, it varies from process to process. Even for the same process, it varies from one kinematic region to another. So you have to take, you, you always have to understand where, uh, uh, what are uh, the, you know, the general qualitative feature which should be valid for all processes and the details which may or may not be true for a specific process. <coughs> okay? So now uh, let's uh, go to the uh, last part uh, of this introductory course. So I've covered the basic ideas and basic principles uh, of uh, perturbative QCD framework. And the rest of this, uh, this school will be dealing with uh, both standard model and beyond standard model physics, which uh, has to do with uh, 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 preservative QCD. So I just like to run through some of the typical processes for which we, we have specific uh, lectures devoted to them. Sarah already gave the lecture on Yang process. Uh, the other processes will be discussed by other lecturers. Uh, 
I just want to make a few simple comments as kind of an interface between my introductory course and the other courses. Uh, all the details uh, you will find in the other ones. So let's review what kind of uh, 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 things come into consideration in particular. Since we've already discussed deep inelastic scattering, let's talk a little bit about the, very, uh, the hadron, hadron collision processes. So at uh, these kind of machines, you have hadrons, colliding on hadrons. And we're interested in standard model processes, uh, WZ production, Dryan production, and so on. And uh, heavy cork production, and Higgs, and new particles, whatever. <laughs> uh, what's in common for all of these processes are certain aspects of the kinematics which is shared between all these different processes and a certain uh, uh, QCD based uh, uh, guidelines which I will mention as we go along. First of all, in order to apply the uh, QCD framework, we always need a, at least one large scale in order to apply asymptotic freedom. So in the case of lepton pair production, it is the invariant mass of the lepton pair. In WZ physics, the, the mass of the WZ. And if you have, uh, uh, say, uh, jet production or direct photon production, uh, then you need to have a large scale, which is oftentimes the transverse momentum of the jet or the uh, uh, photon, which sets the scale, which allows us, which uh, uh, allows us to use the probability approach. So, if we look at the interaction at the center of mass frame of the hadron collider and choose that to be the z-axis, again, it's convenient to use the Lightcomb coordinates. Then the familiar rapidity variable is just the ratio of the plus. Uh, the minus components of a typical momentum, let's call it Q. One thing, uh, one nice feature about the Lightcomb coordinates, which I didn't mention uh, yesterday, was the fact that uh, under a Lorentz transformation along the direction of the, your z axis, you see. Uh, the energy E or the momentum P of Z uh, transform in a relatively complicated way, you know, they transform into each other, right? But the light cone coordinates have the nice feature that when you perform a Lorentz transformation in that direction, the plus component just gets multiplied by E to the power of the hyperbolic angle, which for basically the velocity of your uh, Lorentz transformation, and uh, the minus component goes with the inverse power of that. And the ratio, of course, is just uh, uh, twice uh, that difference. And what that makes is that uh, the rapidity, uh, the, the, so the rapidity has a, a simply, uh, well, it's written here, as you can see. Uh, the rapidity basically uh, is related to uh, just that. So when you make a Lorentz transformation, the rapidity just changes additively. Just adds a, adds a velocity factor or minus a velocity factor. It makes uh, the discussion uh, much, much simpler. And the differences between rapidities of two particles remain invariant in the Lorentz boosts. So make all the, all the Lorentz frames which move in the same direction, render it all uh, equivalent to each other. So the results are much more natural state in these light components. Just as I said here. Um, as also, as uh, you know, that uh, the, this rapidity definition is very closely approximated by a what's called a pseudo rapidity, uh, which is just the tangent of the 
an angle when you have a small momentum, transverse momentum, then this is a very good approximation. So suppose we uh, think about the vector boson production uh, in hydrohydro collisions, then Sarah already mentioned that the, uh, the in the naive pattern modeling, the fraction of momentum are uh, just given by these simple quantities, which I won't repeat. Uh, one uh, remark I'd like to make is that, uh, of course, we are writing, by writing down this formula here, we assume that factorization holds. And Sarah mentioned the proof of this factorization uh, was only uh, uh, done in 1985 or so. The reason it was complicated to establish uh, the factorization theorem, as opposed to for the case of DP elastic scattering and E plus E minus, is because both of your hadrons are in the initial state, it, and the soft gluons that can be exchanged between the partons here with zero mass uh, uh, gauge uh, particles uh, considerably complicates uh, the demonstration of factorization. Uh, I think I mentioned that the first proofs of the published proofs of this was in fact challenged by others and later on you know, more subtle uh, points were demonstrated and everybody now agree that uh, this picture uh, actually uh, uh, the, the, the factorization uh, theorem does apply in this case. Now, Sarah mentioned the important historical role that uh, the Drawian process have played and so I won't repeat that. This clinched the case for the uh, for this quark pattern picture uh, because you find that the the same pattern distribution functions defined, I mean, obtained in deep elastic scattering actually predict the correct uh, drug end cross action. Except one thing she did not uh, explicitly mention that it it was absolutely crucial for establishing QCD. Because, in fact, the first naive prediction was a factor of three off from the observed gravity. But at the same time, during that time, there was other evidence that there is an additional degree of freedom involved in QCD, the color degree of freedom. So once you put that color degree of freedom in, you get exact good agreement. So it played an absolutely key role in the sense that it also proved the SU3 color being the underlying <coughs> uh, proof for QCD. All right. So let's uh, say a few words about direct photon, which I think Jeff is going to lecture on. The direct photon process at leading water is given by diagrams of this kind, which of course is immediately clear to be very similar to what we already discussed from the elastic scattering. You know, put pull this one to the other side, and then we have the gluon fusion diagram. This is the line reversal, and so on. And uh, uh, the difference between this and the elastic scattering is that there is no here. These are the leading order diagrams. There is no. Uh, 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 the leading order starts from order alpha rather than uh, or be independent of alpha. Historically, this was a very, there was high hopes for this because this, because this is leading order, it gives you a direct handle on the initial state gluon. Like, Aha, we can measure the gluon distribution directly from this process. Uh, however, uh, unfortunately, a number of complications come in, which uh, Jeff will describe to you. I'll just give you a hint so you can be uh, prepared for it. Uh, first of all, the real photon, uh, when uh, the direct photon uh, means a uh, uh, photon we think is a very simple object, unlike a hadron. But in reality, the photon actually has what's called a point-like component 
And uh, hadronic-like component, because it's a vector particle, in fact, it behaves a part of the time uh, like a vector, uh, uh, like object, like a Romeson or whatever. And that actually complicates the matter. Uh, that, that is because uh, a process like this can be very uh, confused with a he pure hydronic process like this, for instance, which is gluon quark scattering. But then this state of gluon can actually fragment, for instance, into a photon and organic quark pair or something. This is called the fragmentation of the photon from the gluon. So this process, which is intrinsically a hydronic process, can be confused with this one, which introduces a complication, which, uh, which uh, uh, you, will, you will get more into. The other complication is because the PT is because you need a large scale PT. And, but the PT spectrum for such a process is very steep. <coughs> On a logarithmic scale, it varies several orders of magnitude. When you measure the transverse momentum of the direct photon, there is an intrinsic experimental resolution. So you know the PT only to within a certain range. But if you just make a small mistake in the measurement of the uh, transverse momentum, because of the steep uh, slope here, you get very different uh, uh, predictions. <coughs> this therefore smears your, your, your predictions and makes the comparison between theory and experiment uh, much more complex. This broadening, there's in, and also your partons, uh, because the multi gluon emission can have an intrinsic broadening, and that's, uh, uh, I think this uh, is uh, one of the uh, important uh, features that needs to be uh, under, I mean, still under uh, study by a lot of theorists, and uh, again, in a specialized course, uh, you will hear more about it. The other process that we have, of course, on, of course is inclusive jet uh, production, which uh, in recent years actually played an important role to help us uh, uh, determine the gluon distributions. Uh, because this, again, is a process which is very sensitive to the uh, incoming gluons. Uh, and the cross-section is something like this. But the practical problem here is when you say jet production, what do you mean by jet? And the jets are in practice uh, determined by, uh, defined by something, uh, some algorithm, which is called the jet definition. And there are certain re basic requirements as to uh, what constitutes a good jet definition and one necessary condition, of course, uh, is it needs to be uh, infrared safe so you can theoretically calculate it. From an experimental point of view, however, if you want to compare theory with experiment in a meaningful way, experimentally it must be conveniently, but it can be conven conveniently implemented, but also it has to be unambiguous. So, in order to <coughs> infer real physics out of such comparisons, everybody, theorists and experimentalists, and also different experimentalists and different theorists, must all agree on the same algorithm so that you can produce meaningful physics. So these are all necessary conditions. But Guess which one of these is the hardest to actually realize in nature? <laughs> you know the answer, right? This is almost impossible to realize over all these many years that there's, people are still arguing and different experimental groups are still using very, you know, rather different uh, uh, algorithms and lots of arguments, people get angry about that and to Houston being 
probably will uh, tell you some more about uh, his own peeps about this. I'm probably get angry too. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just giving you uh, a, a advanced advertis advertisement to for entertainment, uh, if you like. Uh. But anyway, last topic that I will mention is heavy core uh, production, for which you also have a course given by uh, Carlo uh, on the area. And there, the problem is uh, what you need to pay attention to is the fact that if you have produced a heavy work in the final state, the uh, you ask yourself what are the scales involved in this in this process? Because I've said so much about the importance of scales. Right? Now so you have the usual scales. Uh, that we have talked about the proton mass, the lambda QCD. Whoops, this should be lambda. As you can see, this is just a difference between the uh, whatever font I was using, normal font and the simple font. That we have to change the font. Right? This is lambda QCD, and whatever the your 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 normal uh, hard scale. But now, in addition, you have. The additional scale, which is the mass of the heavy core, which is much, much, by definition, much, much larger than lambda QCD. So instead of one single large scale, say the transverse momentum or, or the center of mass energy, whatever, now you have one more additional scale. This becomes a multi scale problem, and the problem becomes non trivial. For instance, if you go back a couple years, a few years, there are two very, what looks like very distinctive approaches to this problem. On the one hand, if you do, uh, if you use uh, uh, event generator prop, uh, you know, prop, uh, programs, Pythia, Herwig, or uh, you look at CTAC global analysis or MRST, whatever, uh, the formalism that's used is the zero mass formalism, in which you would have a charm distribution, you can calculate charm production, bottom production, and so on, but you basically assume that these heavy particles behave just like the other particles once you pass its, the threshold of production. In other words, you are treating this mass not so different from the other masses once you are above its threshold. This is called the variable flavor number scheme, meaning that after you pass the bottom <coughs> threshold, you have four flavors of quarks. After you pass the uh, threshold for producing bottom, you have three flavor, five flavors, and you are all used to that, of course, right? You talk about charm, bottom distributions, and bottom distributions, and so on. So we take it for granted. A lot of people take it for granted. But there was a, almost the opposite uh, approach uh, which is used by those theorists who calculate the heavy pork production cross-sections to next leading order, to next next leading order, and next, you know, whatever. In those calculations, you do an order by order calculation, assuming this part of this pork mass is a large scale, so that it's been produced only in the final state. And for the initial state, you only take the gluon and the light force. And that's how those calculations are done. Those cal when you keep the mass, the calculations are very hard calculations. The next leading order calculations was done in the early 90s by several groups uh, with uh, a lot of effort. But they were all done in this scheme, so-called fixed flavor number scheme, Namely, if you want to calculate the charm production cross-section, you assume you use the three flavor scheme where you only have the gluon and the UDS quarks in the initial state. Similarly, when you calculate the bottom production, you use only gluon, UDS, and charm in the initial state. So in other words, in this case, you are assuming this scale to be much, much larger than every other scale, in particular, larger than Q. And in the other case, it's just the other way around. 
And so you have a dichotomy here, which almost look like you are taking two you know, opposite approaches. But fortunately, you don't have just a binary world. The, the fact that uh, Collins has demonstrated that the factorization picture like this is actually independent of the mass parameter of the uh, in the Lagrangian gives you a formalism which actually is valid for any value of this ratio here and which in that general formalism in one limit it reduces to this and in the other limit it reduces to that and uh, you in the intermediate region you have a nice well-defined interpolation uh, between the two and I assume that Carl uh, will uh, talk about that uh, aspect for that. So believe it or not I'm pretty much I'm, uh, actually finished on time and uh, I hope so I have some slides about these two approaches but I'll leave it to Carl so uh, so this is my last slide. Um, so the heavy core production is just uh, in one example of a multi-scale process. Other multi-scale process uh, I will just mention, which again will occur in uh, some of the other courses, in particular Sturman's course about resummation. Because when you have multi-scale problem, means that you get these large logarithms of the ratios between different uh, scales. When you have only one large scale, we take care of that by introducing factorization, this mu uh, factorization scale, which then sort of uh, reduces, which then takes out the soft part and uh, uh, and then leaving you behind this logarithm of the large scale Q divided by this factorization scale and as I said as long as you choose the factorization scale to be of the same order of Q because you have the freedom of choosing so then you neutralize it, this logarithm right? but once you have one more scale you also have the logarithm of the ratio of that additional scale to Q or once you choose mu to be of the same order as Q you have the alternatively you have the ratio between this additional scale and mu itself you can neutralize one of these logs once you have done that you have no more freedom to neutralize the second one or if you have a third one you have. And so the formalism that I've talked about, which is the basic QCD formalism, is not, is not adequate anymore. In the DPE elastic scattering, this already occurs if you have, you are in the small x region. x, if you remember, is the ratio of Q squared over nu, right? In the Birkin limit, we assume this ratio to be some fixed number, not so large, not so small. But when you go to small x, this becomes a multi-scale problem because q squared and mu become of different order, and that requires a different treatment, which is the BMKL. But you have other uh, 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 problems, such as in, in say WZ production. Suppose you look at the transverse momentum of the W and Z that's a different scale than the mass of the W and Z. So for instance, you go to a region where the transverse momentum is a few GeV, well, then the ratio between that transverse momentum and the W mass is large. Then you get large logarithms of that kind, which again makes your uh, prediction uh, Questionable, and in particular, if you ask what's the cross action when PT goes to zero, get what's the answer? Guess what the answer is when you calculate the order, order, order by order interpolation theory. Guess what the answer is? 
infinity, of course, because you have these logarithms when pt goes to zero, it, it's infinite. So you need to use R out. Boy, I'm missing some physics there. I have to learn how to control this class of logarithm, and that is resummation. So, uh, so in addition to small x resummation, you you have you have transverse momentum uh, needs to be resummed. That goes uh, uh, in, under the name of Sudakov. Uh, uh, after you've done resummation, you get the so-called Sudakov effect uh, factors. And when you go to the other limit of x close to 1, uh, another class of uh, logarithm comes in, logarithm of 1 minus x. And this has to do with the threshold behavior, which needs resummation. And then, of course, some of these can happen at the same time. PT resummation and threshold resummation actually can occur at the same time, and VFKL and, and the DGLAB, which we mentioned, can uh, be happen at the same time. And then, in addition to all these logarithms, there are power law corrections, which uh, uh, are again new physics because everything we've talked about are valid up to corrections of the power of the small mass m divided by q squared and things like that. And these power law corrections goes under the name of higher twist and so on. Anyway, so these are the advanced topics which you are going to have fun with for the rest of the summer school. Okay, I'm done.